Hi, my name is Chris Moore. I'm with the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. And on behalf of biopharmaceutical innovators in the United States and the more than 800,000 women and men they employ across the country, Pharma appreciates this opportunity to testify before the Special 301 <coughs> Committee. The United States is the global leader in medicines research, intellectual property, including patents and regulatory data protection, drives and sustains biopharmaceutical innovation. It enables access to today's medicines and promotes investment in tomorrow's treatments and cures. Where markets are open and intellectual property is protected, pharma members have the predictability and certainty necessary to research, develop, and deliver new medicines for patients who need them. But today's hearing comes at a time when innovators face unprecedented challenges in major overseas markets that threaten medical advances and put American jobs and exports at risk. Special 301 gives the administration a powerful tool to identify and address severe and pressing barriers abroad and to level the playing field. Special 301 is not only about promoting adequate and effective intellectual property protection, it's also about ensuring our trading partners provide fair access to their markets and appropriately value new advances. We urge the administration to use Special 301 to address discriminatory pricing policies in Canada, Korea, and Japan that would benefit drug companies in those countries at the expense of medicines developed in the United States. Proposed changes to Canada's pricing policies are aimed solely at patented medicines and would discourage the launch of competing products. New pricing policies in Korea and Japan use biased criteria designed to allow local companies to get a price advantage. In Canada and Korea, American innovators also face a range of intellectual property challenges, including inadequate patent term restoration. For these reasons, we ask that Canada and Korea be named priority foreign countries and that Japan be placed on the priority watch list. Equally troubling are industrial policies that discriminate against U.S. manufactured goods. Turkey has decided to remove products from its national reimbursement list that are not produced in Turkey. On the very day we submitted our Special 301 comments, Turkey delisted the first wave of 44 products and further waves of delisting are expected throughout 2018. We urge that Turkey be placed on the priority watch list and that USTR conduct an out-of-cycle review. Pharma's submission also identifies top intellectual property barriers and threats abroad that require urgent action. Last year, for example, Malaysia announced a compulsory license for an innovative medicine, a move that appears designed to facilitate the local development of a competing combination product. Contrary to its own procedures, the Colombian government accepted a petition for review in December that could result in compulsory licensing of patents protecting an entire class of innovative medicines. Saudi Arabia has knowingly facilitated the infringement of breakthrough treatments by approving the marketing of competing products during the period of patent or regulatory data protection. We ask that Malaysia be named a priority foreign country and that Colombia and Saudi Arabia be placed on the priority watch list. Pharma members are facing growing intellectual property barriers and threats in the European Union, the United Arab Emirates, and a range of multilateral forums. Despite its global leadership in medical research, the European Union is considering a plan that would undermine innovation by allowing local companies to make and export copies of patented medicines during the period of supplemental protection. The United Arab Emirates is a member of the Gulf Cooperation Council Patent Office, but is now demanding that patent applications be filed with the UAE Patent Office, putting the status of GCC patents uh, and pending patent applications in doubt. This demand appears to apply only to biopharmaceutical patent applications, raising questions about the UAE's compliance with its WTO obligations. Pharma asks that the European Union and the UAE be included on the watch list, and it urges USTR to address these and other challenges outlined in our submission using all available tools. We particularly urge USTR and other federal agencies to address market access and intellectual property challenges in countries like Australia, Canada, Colombia, and Korea that are U.S. trade agreement partners. Ongoing NAFTA and chorus negotiations provide an immediate opportunity to address pressing concerns and to enforce existing rules. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We look forward to answering your questions and to working with you to address the concerns described in our submission. Thank you very much for your testimony. The first question is from USTR. Are there any countries that have been listed in previous Special 301 reports for issues of concern to your members that you would no longer recommend we include if, for example, the market is not of the same size or importance as other markets that you nominate? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, like other organizations, uh, we seek each year to respond to your request for comments for the Special 301 report in a way that prioritizes what we believe at the time to be the most serious threats that uh, our industry is facing in certain countries around the world. Um, we um, sometimes uh, that results in uh, listing every year uh, the same types of countries, um, unfortunately. Um, but we don't think it's just the size of the market that is always the, uh, the deciding factor here. Uh, sometimes we're seeing cases where we have a significant impact uh, on our industry, uh, and it could be in a market that might be smaller overall. Uh, the action that that market is taking might uh, set a very dangerous precedent uh, globally. Uh, and so there are a number of factors that go into our decisions in terms of what countries to present to you. Thank you very much. The next question is from HHS. Thank you. Um, your submission argues that discriminatory pricing policies deny fair and equitable market access. Could you please explain the link further? Are there examples where companies have not sold products or where companies have pulled out of specific markets due to such policies? We have, uh, as an industry, are facing uh, market access concerns in a number of different countries around the world. Uh, it is um, relatively, has been relatively rare, but unfortunately an increasing trend. Uh, to see uh, countries that are not produced, uh, sorry, products that are not produced locally uh, unable to enter certain markets. That has been the case with Algeria. It's now the case with, uh, with Turkey, as I mentioned. Uh, but we also see um, a very concerning trend to um, uh, advantage uh, local companies uh, in different markets through discriminatory policies uh, that enable um, uh, companies to get uh, a price advantage uh, if, for example, they are launching products first in that market, they're conducting a certain number of clinical trials in that market, if they're producing in that market, uh, if they're doing joint ventures and sharing um, uh, research and development with a local company. Uh, we think all of those things constitute very serious um, market access challenges and non-tariff barriers that are important to address through the 301 process. Thank you very much. The next question will be asked by ITA. Uh, how does Malaysia's use of compulsory license compare to other countries that have issued compulsory licenses in the past? Well, thank you very much for, uh, for the question. Um, as uh, stated in our submission, um, we believe that compulsory licensing is and should be an extraordinary measure that is used in emergencies and as a last resort. Um, Malaysia has uh, announced uh, a, a compulsory license for an innovative medicine uh, that we believe is, is unwarranted. It took that action despite the offer of a voluntary license by the innovative company involved. Uh, and it appears to have done this uh, really uh, to facilitate the local development of a competing product. And there appears to be an effort underway to export the Malaysia example uh, to countries uh, abroad. And so we believe uh, those things in combination uh, warrant the recommendation that we have made for Malaysia in our special 301 submission, in addition to the other challenges that we see in that market. Thank you very much. The final question will be from USTR. This year, Pharma is requesting that three countries be designated as priority foreign countries. How does Pharma distinguish between these countries and those it has nominated for the priority watch list? 
Thank you. Um, we clearly are looking at um, what we believe to be um, the most onerous and egregious practices uh, that we see in different countries around the world. Uh, we also are looking at the, the impact on our industry and our business, not only in those markets, but also in other markets around the world. Uh, and we are also looking at um, uh, at the uh, the uh, extent uh, of some of those challenges. So, uh, for example, in each of those three markets, uh, we are highlighting certain uh, primary concerns for the industry, but they also go hand in hand with many other challenges, some of which have been uh, very long standing. We're, of course, also looking um, at those countries and their practices against the criteria that are set out in the statute for, uh, for priority foreign countries. And we believe that each of these uh, countries uh, meets those criteria. Thank you very much, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite the representatives from Public Citizen to testify, and please state your name for the record. Hi, it's Bridget Klitsch from Public Citizen. Thank you very much. Thanks for providing me the opportunity to testify here today on behalf of Public Citizen and its more than 400 members and supporters. Public Citizen is a national non-profit consumer advocacy organization with a 45-year history of representing consumers' in interests in Congress, executive branch, and the courts. Public Citizen's Access to Medicines program works with partners worldwide to improve health outcomes through use of pharmaceutical cost-lowering measures, including generic competition. We submitted our written comments for this review last month. My testimony will draw upon those comments and our experiences working on the ground with government agencies, civil society organizations, academics, and patient groups. I will follow the same methodology as our written comments. My oral testimony, however, will focus on two countries, Malaysia and Colombia. But before that, I would like to note some commitments which are articulated in past uh, Special 301 reports, such as the United States respects a trading partner's right to protect public health, and in particular, to promote access to medicines for all. And the United States respects its trading partner's rights to grant compulsory licenses in a manner consistent with the provisions of TRIPS agreement. We support these commitments which echo the uh, World Trade Organization's Doha Declaration on TRIPS Agreement and Public Health. In compliance with these commitments, we would like to address specific practices that can and, that can and should be improved. We suggest the following principles to support this, this modest reform. The Special 301 report should omit any reference, whether expressed or imply to any country's TRIPS compliant or FDA compliant policies that advance the public interest. The Special 301 report should only address intellectual property, not ancillary public policies such as pharmaceutical pricing, unless those policies are specifically alleged to be discriminatory. The Special 301 report should not list countries for adopting U.S. policy preferences, for not adopting for U.S. policy preferences if co those countries have no bilateral or international obligation to adopt the same. We distinguish between TRIPS and FDA standards, and we want you to do the same. We observe that some countries are criticized for not adopting measures such as data exclusivity, pattern linkage, or biologics exclusivity, even if that country doesn't have a trade agreement with the United States expressly and specifically requiring so. Last but not least, criticism in the, in the Special 301 report should be accompanied by express and clearly articulated criteria. Applying these principles to our analysis, I'd like to share some of our observations and comments. I'm going to start with Malaysia. 
as it is one of the countries I've been working on since 2011. Malaysia hasn't been on the special 301 list uh, since 2012. This year, Pharma and Bio asked you to treat Malaysia as a priority foreign country for its decision to expropriate patent rights of Gilead Sciences, which is called by a pharma a disregard of patent rights. Having read both pharma and bio submissions and heard their testimony today, I would like to do some fact checking. As of 2015, it is estimated that around 143 million people are infected with hepatitis C. Hepatitis C infects and damages the liver, and uh, that's the largest organ in our bodies. The, vir the virus usually spreads through a con contact with the infected blood. It is most com commonly transmitted through sharing of needles. But, mm -hmm by injection drug users. Healthcare workers are, or are also at risk, risk through needle sticks and as our baby is born to mothers with hepatitis C. But also, you are, you're at a higher risk if you got a blood transfusion and organ transplant before 1992. Most people who are infected with hepatitis C don't, don't have any symptoms for years. For most patients, it's a chronic illness, which means that it doesn't go away. And for many, it leads to cirrhosis or and liver cancer. An estimated 3.5 million people in the United States are living with chronic hepatitis C infection. And most don't feel ill or knew they are infected, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. More than 500,000 people have been suffering from hepatitis C in Malaysia. So for so for was beverage, so while the when used with another drug can virtually cure most of cases of hepatitis C in 12 months. 12 weeks. The list price of Sovaldi set by the patent holder, Gilead Sciences, in the US is $84,000, and in Malaysia, this is sev at $71,000. The median household income in Malaysia is only $4,500. $4, so the price is about 16 times higher than family's total income. Apart from the price, the patentability of the drug is, is questionable despite its medical benefits and the invention is based on old science and it's disclosed in other patent applications. In 2004, Gilead, sign, Gilead signed a non-exclusive licensing agreement with seven Indian-based company covering 91 lower uh, and middle-income countries, but Malaysia was excluded from the, the licenses. The Malaysian government engaged negotiations with Gilead for two years to be included in the licenses and reduced the price, but the negotiations failed because the Gilead didn't offer uh, lower uh, price lower than $12,000. A year later, in September 2011, 2017, after consultations with the re relevant stakeholders, Malaysian government authorized government use of sofovospovir. And just before the government authorization, in August 12, 2017, Gilead announced that on Twitter that the scope of licenses is extended to cover Malaysia. There was no official announcement or notification to the Malaysian government. This was a very strategic and timely tweet which aimed to an anticipate the Malaysian government decision on government <coughs> use. By doing so, Gilead hoped to avoid reputational damage and wiggle its way out. I see that my time is out, so I'm going to stop here in the interest of time. I mean, we have, a, uh, we have a very comprehensive submission. I recommend you to read that, and we will also submit our comments on Malaysia and Colombia uh, as a post-hearing submission. Thank you very much for your testimony. The first question is from HHS. Thank you. Um, you may have already answered part of this, but you asserted that health advocates in Malaysia found that a voluntary license would not be as effective as Malaysia's own imports plan at reducing price and expanding access. Can you provide any more detail on this? Um, we looked at the WHO report that was cited, but it doesn't appear to address this issue with respect to Malaysia. Yeah, sure. Um, just to, to, to add on what I said about the voluntary licenses, so Malaysian government uh, negotiated the prices for two years with Gilead, and it, the negotiations failed, and then they decided to go with the government use. And the government use only applies for the, the non-commercial public use, so it's not like commercial, it's not for the local industry, it's, it's only for the sale in the, pr the public hospitals. And they were just about to issue the government use. Uh, Gilead tweeted, and said that, oh, we, we expanded the scope of the voluntary licenses, now it covers uh, 
Malaysia, but it was just one tweet. There wasn't there wasn't any uh, official announcement, and the Mal governments do not act on tweets. So the govern uh, government, the cabinet. They, 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 they went on to their decision to issue go government use licenses for the public hospitals. Now the price is like, um, let me check it here. Um, the, so the price is, uh, yeah, uh, 1,000 ringgit. Like there are, uh, the hepatitis C treatment is available in Malaysia for, uh, in, in public hospital and clinics, it's the 1,000 one uh, ringgit, which is equal to $250. And uh, Indonesia is part of the Gilead licenses, and the, uh, according to license conditions, the price for Indonesia is like almost $300 per, uh, per month. So this is a treatment for 12 weeks, which is like more than like three months. So the price is still higher, the price which is offered by Gilead just before the, the 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 government used licenses on Twitter is still higher than than the the price that the Malaysians are like providing this drug to Malaysians patients. Thank you very much. The next question is from the Department of State. Thank you for being here today. What is public citizens' view of the observation? <coughs> that certain countries may have failed to address obstacles to health care access, such as import taxes, lack of rule of law, and underdeveloped supply chains, the resolution of which would likely bring tangible health-related benefits without undermining incentives for innovation. Thank you. I mean, public citizen has a very clear uh, position on special 301 uh, list and the special 301 report. We believe that the report should only address uh, the intellectual property issues, not the ancillary policies like the public health policies. So, uh, but we will be able to, su if, if you are asking about our position, we can submit a position about this as a post-hearing comment. But we strongly believe that we should be discussing intellectual property issues here. That's the scope of it, special 301 list. Thank you. Thank you. And the final question is from USTR. Thank you. In other public submissions for this hearing, we have heard that, for example, most biotechnology companies do not have products on the market and rely heavily on the strength and scope of intellectual property rights to generate the investments needed to commercialize their technologies. How would you respond to the concern that weakening IP protection and enforcement could prevent small and medium-sized companies from bringing products to market? Uh, I'm not clear what you mean by weakening intellectual property protection because, like all the countries, like which are w which are member of WTO, have the same standards as TRIPS standards. So, and there is nothing like weakening of intellectual property. Instead, like there are strengthening, there is like all these efforts to, to strengthen the strengthen the intellectual property policies. And when we talk about innovation, I wrote my PhD on pharmaceutical innovation, and I can give you. A, I can talk about this for like less five hours about, but uh, when we talk about SMEs, SMEs are very particular, you know, and they have like a, the, the, the special circumstances apply to SMEs. And we need, we also need to distinguish which SMEs are we talking about. Are we talking about SMEs in the United States or are we talking about SMEs in other countries? So uh, it is important to distinguish uh, between uh, the, the SME and, and usually biotechnology industry is using this line. Yeah, we are a bunch of SMEs. Yeah, the biotechnological innovation starts in the SMEs, but then, you know, those spin off companies usually like acquired by the big pharmaceutical companies and the, uh, the companies, the big pharmaceutical companies, which we call corporations, sell those drugs in the market, not the SMEs. Thank you very much for your testimony. At this point, I'd like to call representatives of the Trademark Working Group to the table and remind them to state their name for the record. Good afternoon. Uh, Paul Kilmer on behalf of the Trademark Working Group. Uh, this year, the Trademark Working Group asked that its participants uh, identify those foreign trademark laws and practices that cost them the most time and money. 
The most costly trademark matters identified by our participants are, number one, the absence of relative grounds or likelihood of confusion examination by foreign trademark offices, the absence of relative ground refusals in jurisdictions such as the European Union and its member states is leading to thousands of registrations for virtually identical marks for overlapping or highly related goods and services. This fact has forced U.S. companies to bring millions of dollars worth of what should be unnecessary opposition proceedings every year. Number two, the absence of default judgments in opposition and invalidation proceedings in China, Europe, Brazil, Chile, Japan, and South Korea. The unavailability of default judgments forces U.S. companies to adduce evidence and detailed arguments against applicants and registrants who have expressed no interest in defending their trademark filings. Number three, requirements for recordation of licensed users in nations such as Brazil, India, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Thailand. Such requirements are cumbersome and unnecessary and represent a trap for the unwary which may lead to forfeiture of trademark rights. Number four, legalization requirements in nations such as Argentina, China, Egypt, Mexico, and Russia continue to unnecessarily increase the cost and impede the ability of U.S. trademark owners to register and otherwise protect their rights. Number five, the lack of acceptance of letters of consent or coexistence agreements to allow for registration of similar marks in nations such as Argentina, Brazil, China, Japan, Mexico, and Thailand creates an unnecessary bar to registration. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has long recognized that commercial enterprises are generally in a better position than governments to assess whether the concurrent use of their respective marks will create consumer confusion. Number six, China in general. The bulk of comments received by our group relate to issues encountered by foreign trademark owners in China. These issues include elimination of direct appeals from the China Trademark Office to the Trademark Review and Adjudication Board by unsuccessful opposers, most of whom are foreign companies. This situation is exacerbated by continued poor decision making by China Trademark Office opposition examiners. The Chinese system also continues to suffer from a disregard for affidavits and witness declarations in inter partes proceedings. There are also unreasonably high standards for establishing well-known mark status and narrow protection for marks declared well-known. A glaring lack of transparency invades all phases of trademark prosecution, opposition, and invalidation practice in China. Number seven, oppositions. The absence of effective opposition proceedings in a number of nations such as Russia, Ukraine, Indonesia, and Panama allows trademark pirates to steal valuable brands, especially those of foreign trademark owners. Number eight, the slows. Nations such as India, Brazil, the Philippines, and Malaysia are notorious and slow in adjudicating trademark oppositions and cancellations. India is adjudicating only more recently filed proceedings in a timely manner. Infringers take advantage of such non-functioning systems to substantially delay registration of foreign trademarks. Number nine, certification marks. Despite USTR highlighting this area in its last four Special 301 reports, many nations ranging from Algeria to Yemen still do not afford protection to certification marks. Number 10, multi-class applications. More than 35 nations, including Brazil, Mexico, the Philippines, South Africa, and, and Thailand, still require single-class trademark applications. Such systems lead to additional cost, both in terms of initial filings and in relation to docketing and maintenance of multiple registration. Stealth Paris Convention applications. There still continue to be several nations in which newly filed applications may not be effectively located during the six-month Paris Convention priority period. These include Cyprus, Guyana, Indonesia, and sometimes China, although indexing in China has begun to pick up in recent years. Finally, a number of nations do not have letter of protest procedures available to object to applications under examination. These nations include Australia, Brazil, China, Colombia, South Africa, and Thailand. Having letter of protest procedures would prevent infringing and otherwise objectionable marks 
were being advertised for purposes of opposition, thus reducing the cost of objecting to inappropriate filings. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. The first question is from USTR. Among the many issues you listed in your submission, which should the <coughs> government of India prioritize for near-term action? I think the most important one is to catch up on uh, very ancient uh, cancellation and opposition proceedings. Uh, I have a couple of proceedings pending for clients of mine that go back 12 to 14 years. And I think if they could begin the process of eliminating that tremendous backlog of old opposition and cancellation proceedings, they would go a long way towards satisfying a lot of the issues that have been raised in relation to India. Thank you. The next question is from USPTO. Thank you. You noted that uh, two of the most costly issues for trademark owners are the mandatory recordation of licenses or registered user requirements and the lack of default judgments. Yes. In countries where license uh, recordal is not mandatory, can you provide examples where non-recordal uh, can hinder a company's ability uh, to enforce its marks? And another question. Similarly, uh, in jurisdictions uh, without default judgments, uh, do you encounter instances where your companies have had to waste resources uh, defending against frivolous oppositions? Mm. Yes, uh, in relation to recordal of licensed user, there have been instances where companies have actually lost their trademark rights entirely by failing to uh, abide by licensed user requirements. And I personally experienced that with a couple of clients of mine. Uh, so it can be uh, more than a little detrimental uh, to fail to record licensed users in certain nations. And we detail in our re full report uh, those nations that have the most egregious, if you will, requirements uh, for licensed users. Uh, in, ter in terms of default judgment, um, I don't, I'm really not familiar with any instances in which U.S. companies have, have been uh, adversely affected uh, by uh, nations that impose default judgments. Is that the nature of your inquiry? That's right. Okay. Uh, I'm really not familiar with that. I think uh, most American companies are, are prepared to uh, encounter the U.S. legal system. And I think they're greatly relieved when they go overseas and uh, they don't have discovery and they don't have motions practice and they don't have live witnesses and everything is done on written submissions in, in the form of affidavits and so forth. So I think they actually find, uh, quite frankly, many uh, foreign opposition cancellation and even litigation procedures uh, a lot less costly and time consuming than what we have in the United States and in our odd way grateful uh, to be able to take advantage of those systems. Thank you very much. The next question is from Department of State. <laughs> Sorry, second. don't want to leave too soon. No. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Your written submission touches a little bit upon the European Union, including that the standard for proving acquired distinctiveness for, or for configuration marks appears mm -hmm. to be higher than many other jurisdictions. Can you elaborate more on your assessment of the EU and what reforms you would recommend seeing take place there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, definitely uh, evidence of proof of what we would call secondary meaning, uh, consumer recognition of design marks and logos and uh, as well as all kinds of trade dress is a much higher standard to meet uh, in the EU than it is here. They also have design legislation, which I think is confusing uh, to still to a lot of American companies as to what is protected under European design legislation versus what is protected by trademark rights. Uh, and I would like to see a little more clarification in, in that area as well. But as I stated in my comments, I mean, the major issue with the European Union uh, is the absence of likelihood of confusion analysis, uh, relative rights examination in the trademark examination process. Uh, that is just allowing hundreds of marks, if not thousands of marks, to get through the European system every year that are almost identical to U.S. trademark owners' rights in Europe. And they just go through the system, and then the U.S. trademark owner has to first catch them, uh, find out they're there, and then spend the time and money to oppose them. Uh, and, and most of those cases, again, are not defended, and the European Union doesn't have default judgments. So we have to end up going through the entire process for our clients. 
thousands and thousands of dollars are spent and the other side doesn't even bother to defend and at the end of the day yes you win but at what a cost thank you very much for your testimony Thanks. at this time I'd like to call the representative for the Union for Affordable Cancer Treatment to testify and please state your name for the record Manuel Ras for the Union for Affordable Cancer Treatment. Good afternoon. I put my glasses. I have to make a choice between seeing my notes or you. I'm at that point. Choose your notes. <laughs> I'm speaking today on behalf of the Union for Affordable Cancer Treatment, which filed a comments in this docket on February 6, 2018. The Union for Affordable Cancer Treatment, as the name indicates, created in 2014, is concerned about the ever-increasing cost of cancer medication in the U.S. and globally, and we are committed to universal access to new technologies in aff at affordable prices. Based on the process that brings us here again, as well as comments provided by industry representatives, the staff of USTR will, I quote, call out foreign countries and expose the laws, policies, and practices that fail to provide adequate and effective IP protection and enforcement, end of quote. USDR says one of the, I quote again, top trade priorities for the Trump administration is to use all possible source of leverage, end quote, in order to ensure that US, and I'm quoting again, that US owners of IP have a full and fair opportunity to use and profit from their IP around the globe, end quote. What's wrong with this? The administration aggressive efforts to defend American from armed for IP related trade barriers, end quote, means in plain language, in cancer patients language, in regards to new drugs, vaccine, and diagnostic technology, higher prices. Higher prices mean several things for patients, which is another word for people. People who are injured or have a disease or a condition that requires a treatment that involves a new drug. Higher prices mean that many people, and indeed most people, who need a new drug won't have access. And those who do may fa face financial hardship, a financial disaster crisis coming on top of another medical crisis. That's what pharma wants from you. They want you to use all possible sources of leverage to make drug prices higher. They want you to create a political landscape where countries like Colombia, Chile, Peru, Thailand, Brazil, Malaysia, Indonesia, South Africa, India, and even the Netherlands do not use lawful compulsory licenses to address excessive pricing <coughs> on new drugs. You are supposed to be the defenders of the unfettered monopolies on life-saving technologies. If you succeed, People will die and people will suffer and healthcare budget will waste scarce resources on overpriced med medicine. So you act, of course, is opposed to this approach. You act does not want USDR to put patents before patients or drug companies before people. You act is also committed to innovation. We need it. And we know that this depends upon access to knowledge and both public and private sector investment in R&D. Because you act favors both innovation and access, we support efforts in the U.S. Congress and around the world to reform a system of financing medical innovation. We want government, including the United States, to progressively delink the incentive to invest in R&D from the prices of product that we have to pay. We also want the global negotiation on innovation to stop focusing solely on private sector incentive like patent monopolies. In creating global norms on R&D funding, government need to embrace more inclusive approaches that recognize the value and importance of public sector investment in biomedical R&D as in the US. The United States is a world leader in public sector funding of R&D through such agencies as the NIH, BARDA, the National Science Foundation, Department of Defense, Veterans Affairs, and Energy. USTR should be encouraging other government to step up their public sector funding on bio biomedical R&D, 
including, most importantly, the elements that become public goods, advancing medical science. UACT is concerned about people living in foreign countries, including the billions of persons, the majority of the world population, in fact, living in developing countries. <coughs> Many Americans have little idea, if any, what drug, high drug prices m mean for a country with a per capita income <coughs> that is one-fifth or one-tenth of the United States of America. In 2016, the United States had a per capita income of fi over $56,000 a year. Malaysia has a per capita income of $9,860, just 17% of the U.S. Colombia's per capita income was $6,310, 11% of the U.S. India has a per capita income of $1,670, less than 3% of the U.S. And for the bottom 80% of the population in these countries, things are much, much worse. If you target this country over drug prices, you are, getting, you are going to kill poor people, more poor people. But concern for people living outside the United States is not our only concerns. I live right here. I'm a cancer patient, alive because an effective new drug that is extremely expensive. Every three weeks, since 2010, it's about $20,000. I'm in touch with other cancer patients who can't afford this. We are all living in fear we will lose our insurance, be forced to pay the 20 or 30 percent of the cost of drugs that can cost more than $150,000 per year, or be denied coverage because the drug is off-label or off-formulary, or because of other real barrier to reimbursement and access. But we all know the United States itself needs to curb excessive prices on drugs. If you force every other country to abandon the means of doing so, you, look, you lock the United States into an expensive and unsustainable system that we can't afford and which is hurting us more than many here will admit. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. The first question is from HHS. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, you have raised a number of important concerns about the impact that barriers to access to medicines can have on patients, both in the United States and abroad. However, cancer treatment is also an area where recent innovations have generated enormous benefits for patients. Do you have any concerns about how a lack of adequate and effective intellectual property protection in certain countries might impact incentives for future innovations in cancer care? Well, of course, I would, uh, I would like to uh, ask the members of UAC to uh, answer in writing to your very interesting question. Um, my first in instinct is, is always, as you know, to tell you that innovation is probably even more important to patients than uh, to many uh, representatives of the industry here because it's a question of life and death. So it's not just money. And uh, I do think that we believe that innovation is costly and patients recognize that they have to pay for innovation. We just don't like the, uh, the, the rationing, which is due to the, the financing is based on the monopoly. And we think there must be other ways. You all are very creative and intelligent people here. Is there any other way to finance something than to make it scarce and almost unaccessible for most people in the world? Thank you. I think the answer to your question, if I had it, uh, I would um, probably have a different job in the U.S. government, um, <laughs> which uh, gets to this question from USTR, which is, do you believe that U.S. trade policy should reflect current U.S. IP law and policy? <coughs> Well, I would say that we are uh, at UAC, and, uh, and uh, I think most people I work with, we are all opposed to counterfeit. We are all opposed to piracy and uh, 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 infringement. We do think that when it comes to patent and medicine, life-saving medicine, there should be a different way to look at it from your point of view. And uh, that's why I'm here today, again, <laughs> is to remind you that this is about life and death for many people and maybe people in your families too. So it's not as a, a trademark. I'm all for uh, the, the trademark in, uh, in Europe also and in the US, 
but <laughs> they hire norm in Europe, for what I understand. And uh, I'm even for, uh, for punishing signal piracy. But uh, I would say uh, when it comes to access to medicine, there must be a better way to deal with the issue than to prevent, uh, lower the cost, and increasing access. Thank you very much. And the next question is from the State Department. Your written testimony and your testimony today talked a lot about drug pricing. I wanted to follow on with a similar question previously asked. What is your organization's assessment of the observation that certain countries may have failed to address other obstacles to health care access, such as import taxes, lack of rule of law, and underdeveloped supply chains? the resolution of which could bring tangible health care benefits without undermining incentives for innovation? Well, thank you for your question. I'm not an IP lawyer, but I do understand that this is about IP mostly. But I would, I would say uh, when I see the kind of money that some countries have to spend on access to medicine, it's a wonder that they can spend any money on anything else. And actually, in the U.S., we have a lot of schemes to, uh, to in a way, try to lower the price of medicine. And therefore, we can afford to have hospital and nurses and doctors and regular school. And I, I do think that there's a problem with the, the focus on making the budget of this country totally bankrupt. So they don't have any more resources to spend on anything else. If they want to save a few people with prostate cancer or uh, um, blood cancer, um, so, and some of the countries that are doing these things, uh, like Japan or Korea, are being uh, targeted in the uh, 301 report, when in fact they're doing what either we should do or we are actually doing. Thank you very much and thank you for your testimony. At this time, I'd like to call representatives from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to testify, and please state your name for the record. Um, my name is Ellen Szymanski. I'm Senior Director of International IP at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Global Innovation Policy Center. <coughs> Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and thank you to the U.S. government for all your efforts to promote the protection of intellectual property worldwide. Our submission seeks to highlight both systemic and country-specific challenges. The countries we included this year were selected based on market size, geopolitical significance, and specific IP issues. This year, the Chamber released its International IP Index on February 8th. The index is an empirical assessment of the IP systems in 50 developmentally and geographically diverse economies around the world, and it represents about 90% of GDP. We use over 4,000 data points to finalize these results. The 2018 index reveals a number of trends in global IP protection over the last year. The U.S., U.K., and European economies, for example, remain atop the global IP rankings. Throughout 2017, courts across the EU, U.K., and Australia utilized recent legislative changes to bolster the protection of creative content online. India undertook important steps to recognize patentability computer-related inventions and sustained efforts to roll out IP awareness programs and workshops to implement the tenets of its 2016 national IPR policy. Many other countries are building stronger foundations for IP, including Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam through enforcement uh, and, and uh, awareness campaigns, etc. A number of countries, including Malaysia and Saudi Arabia, introduced policies to enable innovators and creators to utilize IP as an economic and commercial asset to encourage legitimate technology transfer. Obstacles to securing effective patent protection for innovative products emerged in a number of key global markets as well, in the EU, Australia, and Saudi Arabia. Both Malaysia and Colombia use government use license and regulatory proposals, respectively, to circumvent patent protection for innovative biopharmaceutical products to drive down prices. 
South Africa published a draft IP policy which includes proposals to weaken patent protection. Despite the Supreme Court rulings overturning the Promise Doctrine and strong Federal Circuit Court decisions on digital rights management, the Canadian government's commitment to IP-led innovation continues to be called into question, though its action on, through its action on free trade negotiations, proposals to chain, change pricing policies that strip away the fair market value for innovation. The IP index illustrates how countries that invest more in robust IP systems are more likely to receive numerous economic benefits. For example, countries that do well in the index are 45 percent more likely to have their innovation funded, 60 percent more receptive to entrepreneurship. They're producing 75 percent more output in creative and innovative sectors, and they're 25 percent better at utilizing new technology. This speaks to the core principle that is fundamental to a well-functioning, innovative, and creative sector, and that's the ability to receive fair value for your inventions. We hope that the index serves as a tool for all governments who hope to become knowledge-based economies through stronger IP frameworks. Unfortunately, we're also seeing emerging global trends of degradation of IP rights in some of our most developed economies. These trends track the on-the-ground experiences of our member companies and the world's key markets. Uh, this includes online IP theft, uh, counterfeits, illicit streaming devices, challenges relating to fair pricing for innovation, uh, demands for creative designs and consumer products, and inadequate protection of trade secrets and economic espionage. Trade secrets, for example, has become an increasingly valuable asset, but also an increasingly vulnerable asset. While we take note of many of these big challenges, some, there have been some positive steps as well. Furthermore, our special 3 in one submission takes a deeper dive into opportunities and challenges in Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, Colombia, the European Union, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Russia, South Africa, and Turkey. It's 110 pages, so thank you for taking your time with it. On um, China, we know the administration energies have focused on the Section 301 investigation into China's technology transfer, IP, and innovation policies. We believe these issues identified by the administration are longstanding and have undermined the value held by American companies. The Chamber is committed to working with the administration to find a measured solution that protects American jobs and global competitiveness and the bilateral economic relationship. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. <clears throat> the first question is from USTR. Thank you again. Um, you just mentioned some positive developments in your statement as well, but are there any countries that you have that have been listed in previous special 301 reports for issues of concern to your members that you would no longer recommend we include if, for example, the market is not of the same size or importance as other markets that you nominate? That is a great question, and, and I, I, I don't remember offhand every country that we covered last year. Um, so if I could answer that afterwards, I'd be happy to do that in a written submission. Thank you very much. The next question is from the U.S. Copyright Office. Good afternoon. Um, for Australia, could you provide more details on why you believe that expanding the copyright safe harbor to all online providers would undermine its copyright system? Um, sure. Uh, so safe harbors uh, is an important part of uh, creating um, a uh, uh, effective copyright protection system. Um, but if it's misused, if it's misapplied, if it's expanded, then it, it's no longer a safe harbor. It's more like a safe ocean. And we have to create a digital environment that is safe for consumers and also allows the creative arts to make a living wage at their work. If we aren't protecting content, then what we're doing is we're creating a system where only hobbyists, the independently wealthy, or maybe an artist who has <coughs> some backing by charitable works is able to make a living wage, and that's what we don't want. There's a tremendous um, uh, international content market that's not being developed, and we would encourage countries around the world to develop um, proper safe harbor 
um, provisions as well as increased copyright protection uh, in order to develop those industries. Thank you very much. The next question is from HHS. Thank you. You state that in VEMA's process to notify pharmaceutical patent holders when their patents could be infringed is difficult to utilize due to, quote, key gaps in Columbia's civil and administrative framework. Could you elaborate on those key gaps and how they impair the effectiveness of Columbia's system? Well, I do know that we, we had a team meeting with the Columbia minister today. Um, and uh, I'm not as familiar with that detail on uh, Columbia's, um, but I do know it's in our submission. I'd be happy to follow it with more detailed information. Thank you very much. We appreciate your testimony. Thank you. I'd now like to call representatives from the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum uh, to testify and please state your name for the record. Good afternoon, Gaurav Verma, Chief Operating Officer of the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum. Thank you to the committee for giving us this opportunity. USISPF or the Forum is a nonprofit organization that was launched last year. The Forum has 30 board members as their executives, including a dozen Fortune 500 CEOs, three former U.S. ambassadors to India, a former okay. Secretary of Defense, and other senior executives. The forum represents 200 plus member companies from various sectors, including IT, finance, defense, retail, healthcare, energy, manufacturing, and food and agriculture. It's important to note that the US industry's intellectual property experience in India differs by sector. For many of our forum members, their IP experience in India has been positive, and they have not faced serious IP issues. In 2017, we saw several key takeaways with regards to India's IP environment. In my testimony today, I will highlight some positive developments first. Over the past year, the Cell for IPR Promotion and Management conducted several programs for enforcement officials and judges. C CIPAM also launched an IPR awareness campaign for children and an IPR enforcement kit in conjunction with the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce. In 2017, India also merged. Uh, India also announced a merger of the Intellectual Property Appellate Board and the Copyright Board. This was significant as the Copyright Board had previously not been functional. The IPAB has appointed one chairman, and we hope the royalty hearings begin soon, so that the pending cases can be addressed. Moreover, the Copyright Office now has has now published details on copyright cases on its website, increasing efficiency and transparency. To tackle online privacy issues, CIPAM, in, con in collaboration with the National Internet Exchange of India, identified 80 infringing websites last year. The forum commends the states of Maharashtra, West Bengal, Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, and Tamil Nadu who have established IP commercial codes. India's patent administration is improving with the complete digitization of its patent office in a move that is expected to increase efficiency and improve the patent review process. On the regulatory side, our members have welcomed the revised patent examination guidelines for computer-related inventions, removing the requirement that patents for software could only be claimed in conjunction with novel hardware. India has also extended the start startup IP scheme to foreign startups, which will provide a fast-track mechanism for the grant of patents. To further streamline the trademark process, Trademark Rules 2017 were implemented in March which will reduce the number of forms from 74 to 8 consolidated forms for trademark application. These efforts that I just mentioned are greatly improving India's IPR environment, and the forum applauds the work that India has done over the past year on IP, and IP protection. That said, there are some ongoing sector-specific <coughs> IP issues and developments facing forum members that we would like to bring to your attention. In the media and entertainment sector, the Indian film industry earns $2 billion from legitimate sources, such as screening at theaters, home videos, and TV rights. However, it loses nearly $700 million due to piracy, which equates to 35% of the legitimate revenue. Our member companies in the entertainment sector have observed that many pri piracy websites located outside India are supported by online advertisements that are targeted towards Indian consumers. We would like to recommend a creation of the National Copyright Enforcement Task, for task Force this task force should reside within DIPP, IPR cell, and its aim should be to enforce copyright laws. 
The forum further recommends that DIPP and the Copyright Board be fully empowered to address all copyright issues. In this regard, other regulatory bodies should eliminate regulations that conflict with the Copyrights Act granting of exclusive rights. The forum also recommends that India should discourage advertising uh, they place on, um, that place ads on pri piracy websites. Those ads give piracy sites the revenue they need to continue their awful actions. Biopharma infringements remain a concern. These infringements are often detected too late after the damage has done. Moreover, <coughs> lack of patent linkage in the pharmaceutical industry provides leeway to infringers. Our pharmaceutical members have voiced their concern during the threat of st uh, regarding the threat of stricter price controls for patented drugs. Forum members have also noted NPP uses the language of compulsory license to control prices for patented drugs, which is against the principles of patent law and possibly not TRIPS compliant. We have expressed our concerns on CL. Based on these issues in the life sciences sector, the Forum recommends the Government of India maintain a centralized list of patented drug manufacturers, requiring a company to seek license to manufacture a drug to report whether the drug is patented or not. We have noted in our submission that paragraph 19 of the drug price control order was inherently designed for certain emergent situations and for a limited period. The reference to use paragraph 19 as a continuous process for price ceiling controls should be considered, considered in abrogation of the legal mandate of DPCO. The forum also recommends creation of a committee or task force of government of India, industry and other stakeholders to drive and incentivize innovation and further the cause of reformed, evolved IPR regime. In the food and agriculture sector, we have seen serious problems with the biotech regulatory policy since 2010, which have stalled the introduction of innovative products by technology developers. The forum strongly recommends that the government of India should desist from introducing compulsory license or patented technologies or imposing artificial price ceilings, which would further discourage investment in innovation and new technologies. In my closing remarks, it is evident that Government of India has taken several important steps towards a better IPR regime, but into some industry concerns remain unaddressed. The Forum believes that the IP environment must be strengthened in order to create a safe environment that will encourage innovation, entrepreneurship without concerns of infringement. The Forum encourages both governments to initiate a bilateral IP dialogue to signify the importance of IP. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. <coughs> the first question will be from USTR. You note a number of improvements to I India's IP regime over the past year. While many of these improvements have been noted by other industry associations in their submissions, a common refrain is that fundamental deficiencies affecting virtually every IP discipline including patents, regulatory data protection, trade secrets, trademarks, copyrights, and enforcement remain unaddressed. Have you seen Government of India actions that address fundamental issues in any of these areas that warrant stronger consideration by the U.S. government? Thank you. I think we are seeing progress. I don't think we are there as yet. Um, a lot more needs to be done, and but we are seeing a positive directional movement from the Government of India side. Thank you very much. The next question is from the USPTO. Thanks. So among the forum's patent recommendations uh, to the government of India uh, includes a call to improve the transparency uh, in the marketing approval process uh, for pharmaceutical products. Could you please uh, describe the scope of the current problem uh, and the forum's proposed solutions uh, for India's system? Thanks. Great question. Can I get back to you with a written submission? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the U.S. Copyright Office. You mentioned a lack of coordination in intra-agency policies that leads to adjudications on copyrights. What do you mean by this, and what suggestions do you have for improvement of the issue? I think overall we've seen a lack of coordination between different departments of government of India. And that's one of the few things that we have recommended is that the powers lie within a certain agency, which is the Department of Policy Prom Promotion, Investment Policy Promotion, DIPP. Uh, and that will take care of the lack of coordination over there. Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate it. Um, on behalf of the Special 301 Committee, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your day to have this 
exchange with us. We appreciate everyone's comprehensive research, thought, problem-solving ideas, and efforts that went into both the written submissions and the testimony here today. The Special 301 docket will reopen this afternoon and remain open until midnight on March 14th. Post-hearing briefs by interested parties are, that testified today are optional. Please follow the instructions on the agenda or in the original Federal Register Notice, which is also on regulations.gov. A transcript and the video of today's hearing will be available at USTR.gov. We will do our best to get that posted within the next two weeks. Thank you very much to my colleagues on the panel, as well as all of those who testified for your time and attention, um, and a special thanks to the personnel at USTR who took care of today's logistics and setup. Ladies and gentlemen, the special hearing, 301 hearing of 2018 is now adjourned. <laughs>